Welcome everybody. Today we are going to look at the ultimate guide to Sliver Overlord. This deck tech comes courtesy from our friend Derek over in our Discord, a good friend of the channel, one of our previous giveaway winners, uh, submitted this deck to us to review and do a deck tech on, and it does not disappoint. So first up, let's take a look at Sliver Overlord. Like any Sliver's deck, you've got to have a great commander, and this one is all that in a bag of potato chips. So let's check it out. Sliver Overlord is Wooberg for a legendary Sliver Mutant. It's a 7-7, seven, seven, and it has two abilities. The first one is Pay 3. You can search your library for a Sliver card, reveal it, and then put it into your hand, then shuffle. The second one is also Pay 3, and you gain control of a target Sliver. This card is bananas. It's a tutor on a stick. It goes and gets all of your Slivers for you, whatever Sliver you might need for whatever situation you find yourself in. And let me tell you, all of the Slivers are answered for everything slivers are gross they are probably the best typal creature type in my personal opinion just because they're so powerful slivers love other slivers they give other slivers every keyword you could think of all the keyword soup they're on all the slivers and they grant those to other slivers and most of the time they cost like two so cheap so easy to play so much fun Let's get into it. So first we're going to take a look at the creatures in this deck. That's going to include mostly slivers, but we've got a handful of other things in there as well. And one of those things first up is Amoeboid Changeling, which technically is a sliver because it is all creature types at all times. And you can tap it. Target creature gains all creature types until the end of turn. So you're going to turn something that's not a sliver into a sliver. And then a second tap ability, which says target creature loses all creature types until the end of turn. So you can take away all creature types and it will have none nothing and no effect with its kindreds. This card can be really good and we will discuss that a little bit further into the video. We're going to kind of talk about the strategy and kind of the lines a little bit of what this deck wants to do and Amoeboid Changeling is one of the ways we can win. Next up we have Basil Sliver. It is two and a black for a 2-2 two -two Sliver and it says all Slivers have sacrifice this creature, add two black to your mana pool. So a great way to add mana to your mana pool. Then we have a non-Sliver. It is Simic for a mutant. It's a 2-2 two -two and it says activated abilities of creatures you control cost two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the amount of mana an ability costs to activate to be less than one. And then you can tap it and it says the next time target creature adapts this turn, it adapts adapts as though it had no plus one plus one counters on it. We don't really need that part as much. What we're really after is that cost reduction. Again, our commander has two different mana costed abilities, so that will reduce each of those from three to one. And if you can go tutor and put into your hand all the slivers you want for one, my goodness, this is just going to spiral out of control so fast. Next, we have Bone Scythe Sliver. It is a 2-2 two -two for 3 and a white, and it says Sliver creatures you control have double strike. So that includes itself, and it gives all of your slivers double strike. Then we have Cloud Shredder Sliver. It is red-white, and it says Sliver creatures you control have flying and haste. Let me just give you a little hint. Haste is extremely important to our game plan, so we have a little redundancy here with multiple slivers able to give us haste. This one is probably the best one as it gives us haste and flying. The other ones mostly just do haste. Next, we have Crystalline Sliver. It is one in a blue, and it says all slivers have shroud, so that's going to keep our slivers from being able to be targeted. Then we have Diffusion Sliver. It's one in a blue, and it says whenever a sliver creature you control becomes the target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability unless its controller pays two. So it essentially gives all of our slivers ward two. Then we have Dormant Sliver. It is two green blue, and it says all slivers have defender, and when this creature comes into play, draw a card. This is a fringe card for me personally as it gives our slivers defender, and that's not exactly what we want, but again, as we go through some of the lines a little bit later, we'll talk about that a bit more. Specifically, this one is there for the card draw, and then with a sack outlet, we're able to get rid of it if we need to, or we have some non-combat ways to get wins, and this could play into that. Next, we have Dredgescape Sliver. It's one in a black for a 2-2, and it says each sliver card in your graveyard has Unearth 2. And Unearth 2 says, pay 2, return this card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step, or if it would leave the battlefield, unearth only at sorcery speed. So it lets us bring back our slivers for one final hurrah after they've already hit our graveyard, and then we'll exile them. 
Then we have Gale Rider Sliver. It's one blue and gives all slivers flying. Next, we have Gem Hide Sliver. It's one in a green, and it says all slivers have tap add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So it turns all of your slivers into Wooberg or all colors mana dorks. So they can all make any color. This is also integral to our game plan. Then we have Harmonic Sliver for one green white, and it says all slivers have when this creature comes into play, destroy, target, artifact, or enchantment. This is super great as we now have repeatable target removal for artifacts and enchantments then we have heart sliver it's one in a red and gives all sliver creatures haste just be mindful that it is all sliver creatures not just sliver creatures you control typically you're not going to see a lot of slivers in non sliver decks so kind of doesn't matter most of the time but just something to be mindful of then we have hibernation sliver it is one blue and a black and says all slivers have pay to life return this permanent to its owner's hand so in the case of a board wipe you can pick a few of the slivers that you think matter the most or all of them if you have the life to spare and just bounce all of them back to your hand as opposed to letting them all go to the graveyard or to exile then we have homing sliver it's two in a red and it says each sliver card in each player's hand has sliver cycling three again that's going to be all slivers in all players hands to pay three discard that sliver and draw a card instead then we have horn sliver it's two in a green it says all slivers gain trample we have lava belly sliver this is a really good one and a win con for us potentially it is one red white for a 2-2 sliver and it says sliver creatures you control have when this creature enters the battlefield it deals one damage to target player or planeswalker and you gain one life so we're able to ping our opponents for damage as more slivers enter the battlefield then we have mana weft sliver it's also one in a green and also allows sliver creatures you control to tap for one mana of any color so just another way to grant our slivers the ability to tap for mana then we have muscle sliver one in a green it gives all sliver creatures plus one plus one then necrotic sliver which is one white black for a two two and it says all slivers have pay three sacrifice this permanent destroy target permanent now we have unlimited permanent removal this is not restricted to any permanent type it is just a target permanent so that's going to include lands and creatures whereas harmonic sliver only hits the artifacts or enchantments next we have pulmonic sliver it is a three three for three white white and it says all sliver creatures have flying and all slivers have if this permanent would be put into a graveyard you may put it on top of its owner's library instead then we have quick sliver for one in a green and it has flash and it says any player Player may play sliver cards as though they had flash again that's going to be all players not just you however super good then we have root sliver for three and a green and it says root sliver can't be countered sliver spells can't be countered so now we have a way to make our slivers unable to be countered and we already have a way to give them shroud so it makes our board extremely difficult to deal with. Then we have Sentinel Sliver. It is one and a white, and it says Sliver creatures you control have vigilance. That is also really nice in this, especially when they're mana dorks, because now you can swing them out and then still have them to tap in your second main phase to cast more spells. Then we have Shifting Sliver for three and a blue, and it says Slivers can't be blocked except by Slivers. And again, we're most likely going to be the only player with Slivers on the table, and so that basically makes our Slivers unblockable. And then we have a new card from Commander Masters, the Sliver Grave Mother for Wooburg. And it says the legend rule doesn't apply to slivers you control. Each sliver creature card in your graveyard has Encore X, where X is its mana cost. And then this card also has Encore 5. And then you pay 5 to exile this card from your graveyard. For each opponent, create a token copy that attacks that opponent this turn if able. They gain haste, sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step, and you can activate this only as a sorcery. So again, a way to bring back our slivers from the graveyard for one last hurrah, swinging them out, a copy for each of your opponents. Then we have Sliver Hive Lord, which is also Wooburg, and it says sliver creatures you control have indestructible. This is a 5-5. Five five. Indestructible is fantastic. Then we have Sliver Legion, also Wooburg, for a 7-7, and it says all Sliver creatures get plus one, plus one for each other Sliver in play. So you got five out, they all get plus five. It's very gross because it compounds super fast. Then we have Sliver Queen, which is also Wooburg for a 7-7, and it says Sliver Queen also counts as a Sliver. This is a reserve list card and is extremely expensive. I want to say it's sitting at around 300 bucks. That being said, it is super worth it in this deck to have 
if you can have it. And then it also has an ability to pay two, and it says put a sliver token into play. Treat this token as a 1-1 one, one colorless creature. So it puts 1-1 one, one slivers into play. Then we have Spiteful Sliver. It's two and a red, and it says sliver creatures you control have whenever this creature is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target player or planeswalker. So we were talking earlier about Dormant Sliver, which is the one that gives your slivers defender. This is a card that will let you work around that because now you can just dare people to swing into you. And when you take damage, you're just going to deal that much damage to a target player or planeswalker. So potentially... A great way to keep players from attacking you, and you can keep building your board state fairly uninterrupted. Also, a super flavorful way to win would be to have this card out and then play a Blasphemous Act and have each of your slivers take 13 damage, and then you would just have that 13 damage to deal to any of your opponents or Planeswalkers. Next, we have Striking Sliver. It's one red. It gives sliver creatures you control first strike. Then we have Synapse Sliver. It's four and a blue. It says whenever a sliver deals combat damage to a player, its controller may draw a card. So now when our slivers do combat damage, we get to draw cards. And that is a May ability. So that's nice as sometimes you find yourself with 15 or so slivers and you may not want to draw that many cards. Then we have Siphon Sliver. It's two and a black. It says sliver creatures you control have lifelink. This is actually helpful in this deck because our mana base is so tuned with shocks and fetches that we probably are going to be dealing about 10 to 15 damage to ourselves a game just with our mana base. And so having a way to gain a little bit of that back is really good. Uh, then we have the first sliver. It is also Wooberg for a 7-7 that has Cascade. And it says other sliver spells you cast have Cascade. So now every time you play a sliver, you're going to go find a next permanent in your deck for a mana value less than what that sliver was and put it onto the battlefield cascade is broken this card is broken slivers are broken next we have venom sliver it's one in a green it says sliver creatures you control have death touch and then lastly we have maybe one of the most gross cards in this deck it's virulent sliver and all sliver creatures have poisonous one so now they're going to deal combat damage to a player you get a poison counter. A player with 10 or more poison counters loses the game. So now all of our slivers are going to give our opponents poison counters. Next up, we've got sorceries for this deck, and we only have a couple of those. First up, we have Blasphemous Act. Uh, this is a great card, a great board wipe, as most of the time when you need to cast this, you're going to be able to cast it for one red because someone else has completely run away with the board, which is really great because now you can wipe the board and potentially still have a good amount of mana left over, almost all board wipes are four. Blasphemous Act is one of the few that costs less than four. And it could be a potentially cool combat trick with the aforementioned Spiteful Sliver, the one that says whenever this creature is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target player or planeswalker. So even if you have several slivers out and you deal 13 damage wiping the board, then you'll also have a whole bunch of damage to potentially swing around. Then we have a little bit of ramp. We've got Nature's Lore and Three Visits. Both of those are going to go fetch a forest for you. Again, we run the Triumphs and the Shocks in this, and so we're going to be able to go get those lands to fix our mana early on, hopefully. Next, we have Knight's Whisperer. It's a sorcery, and it says draw two cards. You lose two life, just giving us a little bit of card draw. Then we have Pact of the Serpent for one black black. And it says target player draws X cards and loses X life where X is the number of creatures they control of the chosen type. So pick a type slivers and then however many slivers we control we're going to go draw that many cards and then lose that many life and then lastly we have raise the palisade a new card from lord of the rings it is four and a blue and it says choose a creature type return all creatures that aren't of the chosen type to their owner's hands so this is going to hopefully be a one-sided board wipe for us and clear the way for us to swing in for enough damage to get the win Next, we have Instance, and first we have Deadly Rollick, which is a great piece of spot removal. It's three and a black, but if you control your commander, you can pay it without paying its mana cost, and it says Exile Target Creature. So great creature removal. We also have another spell from this cycle. It is Deflecting Swat, two and a red, but if you control your commander, you can cast it without paying its mana cost. And you may choose new targets for target spell or ability. This is just a versatile piece of removal or redirection for us as people try to target our things. 
Then we have Fierce Guardianship, another in this cycle, two in a blue, and you can cast it for free if you control your commander, and it says Counter Target Non-Creature Spell. Then we have Force of Negation. It is one blue blue, and it says if it's not your turn, you may exile a blue card from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. Counter Target Non-Creature Spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. So it's going to exile. It is a so it is a counter spell that exiles instead of sends to the graveyard. Then we have Teferi's Protection. It is two and a white and says until your next turn, your life total can't change and you have protection from everything. All permanents you control phase out. And phased means when they're phased out, they're treated as though they don't exist. They phase in before you untap during your next untap step. And then you exile to Fairy's Protection. The best protection spell in the game. And then lastly we have Utter End. It is two white black for an instant that says exile target non-land permanent. Next we have Artifacts and first we have Arcane Signet which taps for any color in our commander's color identity which is Wooburg so all of them. Then we have Chromatic Lantern which is a three drop and it says lands you control have add one mana of any color and then it itself taps for a mana of any color so that mana fixes us right out of the gate. It allows our fetches and things to immediately be tapped for mana instead of having to sacrifice them and go fetch something and then potentially shock it in or bring in a triome tapped. It's a really good card in this particular deck. Then we have Felwar Stone, which is two, and it also taps for one mana of any color a land an opponent controls could produce. So it's going to at least hit some of what we need, if not all colors. Next, we have Soul Ring, which of course does not tap for colored mana. However, it is one to add to colorless, so a net positive. This is the best card in Commander. So next, we have some enchantments. Most of the enchantments that we have are going to do things similar to what our slivers already do. However, creature removal is the most prevalent removal in the game, so we have some enchantments as backup plans to help us have secondary options to get to where we want to go with this deck. So first up, we have Aura Shards. It says whenever a creature enters a battlefield under your control, you may destroy a target artifact or enchantment. So some more spot removal for us that is repeatable. Then we have Cryptolith Right for one and a green. It says creatures you control have tap add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So another way to make our creatures mana dorks then we have elven chorus which is three in a green and it says you may look at the top card of your library any time you may cast creature spells from the top of your library and then creatures you control have add one mana of any color if you can't tell having our slivers be mana dorks is really good and so we have many ways to hopefully accomplish that. Then we have Growing Rights of Itlamok, which is two and a green. And it says when it enters a battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library. You can reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. So some card advantage there. And then we take the rest of those cards. We put them on the bottom of our library in any order. And then at the beginning of our end step, if we control four or more creatures, we can transform Growing Rights of Itlamok which transforms into a better Gaia's Cradle because it will tap for a single green on its own, which Gaia's Cradle does not. And then it also taps for green for each creature you control, which is what Gaia's Cradle does. So it does take at least a turn to get to this. However, it's very good. You could always cast it in your second main phase just before you pass the turn. And hopefully with four creatures out, it will resolve and you will be able to turn that into a land. Next, we have Guardian Project for three and a green. It says when a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it doesn't have the same name as another creature you control or creature card in your graveyard, draw a card. So in Commander, that's always going to be the case as we only have singleton outside of a handful of cards and none of them are in this deck so every time we cast a non-token creature we are going to be able to draw a card next we have intruder alarm this is two in a blue and it says creatures do not untap during their controllers untap phases whenever any creature comes into play untap all creatures this card is insane in this deck because now we can tap our slivers, we can pay into our commander, go find a sliver in our library, cast that sliver, and then untap all of our creatures, and then keep doing that over and over again. If this comes out and isn't dealt with immediately and you have your commander out, pretty much can win the game, provided you have at least four slivers on board to do this with, and that they can tap for mana. Then we have Kindred Discovery, which is three blue blue, and it says when it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Of course, we're going to choose Slivers. And then whenever a creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks, draw a card. So this is going to also include tokens because it is an enters the battlefield or attacks, and it doesn't say non-token. 
Then we have Mana Echoes for two and two red, and it says whenever a creature comes into play, you may add one mana to your mana pool for each creature you control that shares a creature type with it. This is another card that will absolutely go insane with our commander. Every time a sliver comes into play, token or non-token, it's going to add one to our mana pool for each creature you control that shares a creature type with it. So as long as you have enough colored mana laying around to be able to cast, you also now would have a boatload of colorless mana and you'll be able to keep on casting more and more slivers and putting more and more mana into your mana pool. Then we have Reflections of Litjara. It is four and a blue, and it says, when it enters a battlefield, choose a creature type. Whenever you cast a spell of the chosen type, copy that spell. So now every time we cast a sliver, we're going to get two of that sliver. Obviously, legendary creatures are going to check themselves, and one of those will go away, but our non-legendary creatures will come in with a copy. Next, we have some more card draw. It is two and a blue for the infamous Rhystic Study, and it says whenever an opponent plays a spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays one. And then we have Sylvan Library, some card advantage, uh, one in a green. At the beginning of your draw step, you may draw two additional cards. If you do, choose two cards from your hand drawn this turn. For each of those cards, pay four life or put those back on top of your library. So it just gives you at least the ability to select which card of the top three you want to keep. And then if you decide you want to keep more than your initial draw, you can pay for life for each of those. We do have a little bit of lifelink in this deck, although not very much, so potentially could be good. Just a little bit of situational, but again, card advantage and card selection. And then lastly, we have training grounds. It is one green, and it says activated abilities of creatures you control costs up to two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the amount of mana an ability costs to activate to less than one mana. So again, with our commander, it costs three. It will go down to one. And then with something like Sliver Queen, which it costs two, it would reduce this just to one as it can't be less than one. And then we've got our mana base. We run 35 lands. There are exactly zero basic lands in this deck. It is all going to be lands that tap for multiple colors. It's the fetches. It's the shock lands. It's the triomes. It's the command tower, cavern of souls, path of ancestry, all of those kinds of cards. And that way we can go get whatever we need to get to our five colors as quickly as we possibly can. Okay. So some of the lines in this deck, how do we want to win? Well, the game plan is quite simple. It is get to five colors as fast as possible to cast our commander to then start going and getting the slivers that we need to have and casting those slivers. It takes several slivers to be able to do this, but more often than not, the way you're going to win with this deck is either through massive swings with things like giving our slivers double strike or poison or unblockable, or we're going to go infinite with our sliver queen making infinite slivers, or we're going to make infinite mana and cast our whole deck of slivers and then swing out. Once our commander is out, you probably want to go get something to let your creatures tap for mana, and then you want to find a haste enabler, and from there you want to probably find protection, either with shroud or the sliver that lets our things be uncounterable, and then you want to go get your big guys and things that will do some serious damage and then swing out for the win. Or with something like Lava Belly Sliver, which lets us ping a player for damage each time a creature enters a battlefield under our control, we'll be able to ping an opponent for life. So if we've got enough mana and a way to get more slivers out, we can ping people to death, or we can make sliver tokens with Sliver Queen, um, or we can attack and make more tokens. We can also, with Amoeboid Changeling, we can tap and then untap. If Intruder Alarm is out and creatures untap whenever a creature comes into play, we can potentially grab Amoeboid Changeling to tap it and target a specific creature, turning it into a sliver on our opponent's board, and then paying three into our commander to steal that creature. When that creature then comes back, we can cast another creature, potentially untapping the Amoeboid Changeling, tapping it again to target another creature, turning it into a sliver, and repeating that process until you literally steal the entire board and no one has any creatures except for you. This deck is so much fun to play. It came to us courtesy of one of our patrons, Derek. He sent it over to us to check it out, and we talked through a little bit of some changes that we would possibly make. So let's take a look at what we would potentially do with this deck. As you may see, this deck is outrageously expensive. It is a pet deck for sure. According to Moxfield, it is coming in at about $1,800. Most of that is tied up in the mana base. So one of the very first things that you 
might consider doing if this is something that you would be interested in building on your own is downgrading that mana base just a little bit. Uh, you probably can get away with a lot less than what's there. There are a lot of new lands that have the option to come in untapped if you meet a certain criteria. Several of those are fetchable as well. So you keep the fetches, maybe keep the, some of the shocks and maybe if you want to, you know, some of the triomes. But there are also budget versions of those triomes that don't have the cycling ability on there. So you could maybe go snag some of those. They are also not fetchable, but they will tap for three colors instead of one or two. There are a lot of other ways as well. You could also throw in a couple more ramp spells. We could throw in something like Farseek, which fetches everything but a forest. So that would be another ramp spell, another way to go grab some stuff. You could also put in something like Wood Elves that goes in, gets lands. You could throw in some Mana Dorks as well to get around some of that. And then, you know, you could always throw a handful of basic lands in as well. And this mana base would still be very, very good. Again, with Chromatic Lantern able to mana fix us, that's really good. We also have Fell Warstone and Arcane Signet that both will potentially tap for all five colors. So those are really good. I would take out Utter End, which is a four cost a spot removal spell. It's an exile, which is really good, but for is a little on the expensive side, I would maybe go with something like Assassin's Trophy, which only costs green black. It will target a permanent as well. And then it allows the controller to go search their library for a basic land and put it onto the battlefield untapped and then shuffle. So it does give a basic land to your opponent once you've removed their permanent, but for two mana less, I would probably choose this as well. We could also potentially get rid of something like Night Feeder's Visitation, which is a one-shot for some card draw, and replace that with maybe something like Trouble in Pairs that is going to consistently draw us cards as opposed to a one-time thing. We have a little bit of way to snag some card draw with our slivers. That being said, there's not a whole lot there, and so card draw wins games, so let's maybe find some more ways to draw cards. And speaking of card draw, we could also maybe even get rid of the Growing Rights of Itlamok. It's not super It's not super imperative that we have something like this. We really need access to all five colors to be able to do what this deck wants to do. The flipped version of the growing the the growing rights only taps for green and this at best gets us a creature which our commander already does extremely extremely well so you could potentially remove something like this and then replace it with maybe some protection for your commander like boots or greaves and that way we have access to those specific slivers we want at any time but this deck didn't need a whole whole lot of upgrading or downgrading it really just kind of depends on your personal preference so what we're going to do is throw a budget build of this on moxfield in the description below so you can kind of check out a slightly downgraded more affordable version of this deck and then we'll keep the original one in here as well thank you guys so so much for checking this video out again we really appreciate your time please like and subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content hit that bell down there as well so you get notified every time we upload a video you can also check us out at our other social medias we do lots of box breaks and so if you're interested in buying any packs at a very affordable and discounted rate from what you would be able to get them at your lgs or online jump in our discord or jump into our patreon you will be able to buy those packs there and then we open them on the channel as well we also have a brand new merch store it is right below if you like magic merch attire hoodies shirts all that kind of good stuff hats we've got that down in the links below please go check that out as well it helps to support us and we hope you guys have an amazing and awesome rest of your day and we'll see you next time Bye bye chicka chicka whoa oh yeah